Welcome to the Remnant Truth Network, broadcasting God's truth across the world 24-7, wherever you may be. Dear friends, my name is James Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries coming to you on RTN TV. I'd like to address a subject today that is a common one and one that we've looked at before from various aspects. But it's become an issue again due to recent developments of some materials posted on the internet. Some of it posted on the internet by people we actually otherwise like or agree with. It is the issue of Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. I'll read that please. It says the following. To the Church of Philadelphia is the message. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell upon the earth. It's going to come upon the whole cosmos, the whole system, to test those who dwell upon the earth. Many of my, or in fact nearly all, of my pre-tribulational friends take this as prima facie evidence, as absolute proof that the rapture will have to be pre-tribulational. That is what they say. Well, I'd like to look at what this word actually is in Greek and see if it is what they think it is. But let me continue by pointing out the following. People who are involved in academic theology, who are pre-tribulational, serious, more scholarly people, say the following. I'm quoting from the former president of Dallas Seminary, Dr. John Wilford. He was certainly a Greek scholar, and he wrote a book on the rapture. He was firmly, firmly pre-tribulational, and he has had a lot to do with the pre-tribulational foundations at Dallas Theological Seminary to this day, which has set precedent for much of pre-tribulational thinking globally. He is the chief scholar who is the academic patriarch of pre-tribulationism for our time. He's now with the Lord, but his books and his influence lives on. Dr. Wolverd stated that there is no passage, no passage in the New Testament, none that teaches a pre-tribulational rapture. None. The main scholar, the main academic, the primary advocate of pre-tribulationism from an academic and academic theology perspective says there's no passage who teaches it. Another prominent preacher who is knowledgeable and brings scholarly content into his preaching is John MacArthur from Master's Seminary in California. John MacArthur has stated that the pre-tribulational rapture is between the lines. He says it's not stated, it's between the lines. Both John MacArthur and, more importantly, Dr. Wolverd state that a pre-tribulational position is something they glean, something they glean from an overview of Scripture. It is not something directly stated. <coughs> Let's go to a non-academic perspective of pre-tribulationism. T.A. McMahon, who was the right-hand adjutant of our dear friend and brother, Dave Hunt, whose memory we greatly esteem, he's not with the Lord, but a tremendous man of God, who God used mightily. T.A. McMahon was his adjutant. T.A. McMahon has stated publicly 
that pre-tribulationism or pre-tribulation rapture is something that has to be extrapolated. Extrapolated. It's not directly stated. So we have the brilliant call of Dave Hunt's ministry. And again, nobody has a higher view of Dave Hunt than I do. But his ministry, his former adjutant, Thomas McMahon, says it's something that has to be extrapolated. We see the same in the academic access. John McArthur, Master Seminary, it's between the lines. John Wolverd, it's something we glean. They all say it is not there. They all say there is no verse or passage that states or teaches a pre-tribulational rapture. So while the academic scholars who are saved conservative evangelical academic theologians, knowledgeable in the original languages, the consensus among them is that there is no verse or passage, no pericope anywhere in scripture that says there's a pre-trib rapture. It is an opinion that's gleaned by way of overview. And certain non-academics have agreed with them saying that it's something that has to be extrapolated. It's not there. Remarkably, however, despite the fact that the main academic theologians who are pre-trib say there's no passage that states it, many believers who perhaps are not academic theologians or not knowledgeable in, in biblical languages have stated with good intention that it is. And a primary verse upon which they contend for this position is Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. Because you've kept the word of my perseverance I'll keep you from the hour of testing. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. And they say that that hour of testing is the great tribulation. Therefore, we will not be here for the great tribulation. There must be a pre-tribulational rapture. That is what they say. Let's look at our sister, and again our dear sister, Jan Markell, who on so many other issues I completely agree with her, but she is one of many Christians I know, and even Christians I respect, who take the following view. Let's hear what she's saying. The indictment is, however, groundless. And some of the reasons, Terry, I believe that it's groundless is the church is absent after Revelation 3. There's the concept of imminency or at any moment that the Lord will return, which you just can't work that into a mid- or post-trib scenario. All the verses, uh, Terry, that talk about escaping the wrath to come, and that's God's wrath, and I think that's the big breakdown. They are seeing the wrath as man's wrath because we are under man's wrath, but God is saying that the wrath that we're to escape is his wrath. I think that people today who are assaulting the pre-trib rapture do not understand that mankind has to come under the wrath of man. That's going on. The believers in the Middle East are under terrible wrath, but they are not under God's wrath. That comes out in the tribulation. And he says in Revelation 3.10, he says, since you have kept my demand to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Revelation 3.10. In other words, the wrath that's about to be unfolding in the tribulation, God says, you're going to be spared from that wrath to come. That's all I'm saying is Revelation 3.10 says it all. Well, you've got a situation now where John Wolverd, Dr. John Wolverd says it's not there, or John MacArthur says it's not there, it's between the lines, but Jen Markell takes this view that it is there, and many people agree with her. I'm not attacking Jan personally, I'm just using her as an example. Many, many other people would agree with her. Many pastors, many preachers. 
but not the academic ones, not the Greek scholars, not the theologians who really know how to dismantle the text exegetically in the original language. They don't agree with this position. So you have a schism among pre-tribulationists between the academic, scholarly, and the ordinary preachers. So we have now a kind of schism among our pre-tribulational brethren between the academic theologians, the scholarly pre-tribulationists who are knowledgeable of the original languages and who can exegete the scriptures in Greek. We have a discrepancy between them and so many other preachers and advocates of pre-tribulationism who don't have those qualifications. Who would you listen to? Would you listen to somebody who is an academic theologian who knows the original languages as to what the texts say and mean or don't mean? Or would you listen to someone who does not? Now, I don't say this to demean or to belittle. I'm simply presenting the case that there is a schism among pre-tribulationists between the scholarly and the non-scholarly, or those who are not academic theologians. This is not to demean them as brethren. This is not to say they don't say other good things. Jan Markell says many other good things. I'm just pointing out that this schism exists. Now, another schism exists among our pre-tribulational brethren. Another exists, and it's become quite an issue. That issue is, what is the apostasy, the apostasia? Another remarkably good debater and an academic theologian who is also by profession a lawyer, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, who I like and respect, who I've had the privilege of doing conferences with from time to time. A very credible man who gave a sensational performance in his debate against Hank Hanegraaff. I have a very high view of Dr. Hitchcock, but again, he's from the academic spectrum. Dr. Mark Hitchcock states that the apostasy cannot be the rapture, the word would be harpezo. We have him, and we have those who hold to a traditional so-called pre-tribulational rapture view. I wish we'd all been ready. Don't miss the rapture. Then we have this newfangled view. The newfangled view was in part framed by the Left Behind series by the late Tim LaHaye, who I knew and liked personally, and I again shared platforms with at conferences from time to time. He was not a bad man, but he had this view that the rapture was going to herald a great revival, that a great revival would come after the rapture. Now this is problematic. After the rapture, the book of Revelation tells us in chapter 9, verse 21, they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immoralities, nor of their thefts. People would not repent. There'd be no great revival after the rapture. The age of the church has closed. The time of the Gentiles has come to an end. Most of what the book of Revelation says is going to transpire after the church is removed, or the faithful church is removed, is God is going to judge the kingdom of Antichrist, he's going to judge the apostate church, and he's going to turn his salvific purposes back to his ancient people Israel and the Jews in the darkest hour of their history. What Jeremiah calls Hatekofat Tatsorat Yaakov. This will be the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what the book of Revelation teaches. The overwhelming emphasis is that God goes back to dealing with the Jews once the faithful church is removed. This idea that there's going to be a great revival when the rapture happens and people are going to see, that's not traditional pre-tribulationism. So you have those who have 
gone with the views of Tim LaHaye and those who hold to a traditional pre-tribulationism, I wish we'd all been ready. But let's go back to our friend and brother, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, again, a man who I not only like personally, but I hold in high regard academically as a scholar and as a brother. He's a good man. Pre-tribulational to the hilt. He says the apostasy is not the rapture. We have others saying the apostasy is the rapture based on an underlying word that does not even appear in the text aphistiamai, which means a spatial departure. This term, as used in Second Thessalonians, is not hapex legemini. It's not something that only occurs once. Paul uses a variant of the same term in 1 Timothy chapter 4 concerning the return of Jesus and what will happen before he comes. And he makes it clear that the apostasy is a falling away in 1 Timothy 4. Interpreting scripture in light of scripture, looking at what Paul said about the second coming of Jesus in light of what he said about the second coming of Jesus, looking at what he said about the return of Christ in 1 Timothy to what he said about the return of Christ in 2 Thessalonians, Scripture with Scripture, Paul both places, speaking of the return of Christ in both places, makes it clear that the apostasy is a falling away. Here I agree with Sister Jen Markell. She realizes the apostasy in the contemporary church is what Paul warned of, to the best of my understanding, and she is absolutely in this correct. It's one of the many areas where I actually agree with her, although we disagree on the timing of the rapture. So it is. You've got those who are saying the apostasy is the rapture, a spatial departure, which frankly is contextually nonsensical. The context of 2 Thessalonians 2 does not allow for that. The Lord will send a deluding influence upon them to make them believe what is false. The apostate church comes under a judgment and God gives them over to believe the lies of Antichrist because they don't love a knowledge of the truth. It's contextually nonsensical what they're saying. It's also linguistically and etymologically Next to baseless, the term aphistiamai is not even in the text. It's an underlying term, a root term. And Paul uses the word apostasy in 1 Timothy to speak of the falling away within the church before Christ comes. So the pre-tribulational brethren are divided against themselves. Is the rapture going to be the beginning of a great revival, or is it, I wish we'd all been ready, as pre-tribulationists traditionally said? Is the rapture <laughs> the apostasy, or is the apostasy a great falling away? Which is it? Which is it? Is it hard paid cell, or is it apostasia? Which is it? Uh, they are divided. And they are divided between those who say there is no passage of scripture that says the rapture is pre-tribulational, who are the more theologically trained and literate in Greek access of pre-tribulational opinion versus those who are not academics, well-intentioned but not scholars. Well, let's continue looking at this. They take this message to one of seven churches, Philadelphia. Now, there are three views of these seven churches. I do not believe these views are mutually exclusive. I believe all of these views are simultaneously true. They are different aspects of the same overall scenario. 
The first, quite obviously, is these were seven churches that existed in southern Turkey, then the Roman province of Asia, then a Greek-speaking area at the end of the first century. Making a loop, a sequence. I believe that. Everyone believes that. No question these were seven actual churches. Secondly, there is the panoramic view. The panoramic view says that these, broadly speaking, are seven kinds of churches that can exist generally with particular emphasis on what the church will be like in the last days. It's the Ephesian age, the first century, but it's a panorama of seven kinds of churches that can exist generally. That's the second view. I also agree with that view. The third view is the dispensational view. I'm only moderately dispensational myself. I believe there are two dispensations, not seven. I think that dispensationalism is a truth taken too far, but it is better than covenant theology, which is not true at all. It's that which is held by extreme Calvinists and Reformed people. They say God only ever made two covenants. <laughs> One with, a one with Abraham and one with Adam. Uh, no, the New Testament says the two covenants are the old one with Moses and the new one with Christ. This is the basis of real Calvinism, not the tulip. It's covenant theology, uh, which is inherently replacement theology. Nonetheless, they have that view. The dispensational brethren are closer to the truth. Not the extreme dispensationalists, not the hyper dispensationalists like John Darby, but the moderate dispensationalists say something that's phenomenally interesting. And I agree with them. They say that these seven churches are seven consecutive, howbeit somewhat overlapping periods of church history, the last one being Laodicea. The final church will be in the character of Laodicea. Lukewarm, mistaking material prosperity for God's blessing and blind to their true spiritual state. But there is a faithful remnant within it who the Lord will correct, who are not blind, who will anoint their eyes that they may see. This is the dispensational view. Now, I believe all three positions are correct. I accept the historical view of the seven churches of the first century. I accept the panoramic view. And I accept the dispensational view. I think they're all correct. Not mutually exclusive. Why do I think the dispensational brethren are correct on this? Well, all the sevens in the book of Revelation are sequential. The seven seals. The third is followed by the fourth. The fourth is followed by the fifth. The fifth is followed by the sixth. The seven trumpets. The first is followed by the second. The second is followed by the third. The third is followed by the fourth. The seven peals of thunder. The first, the second, the third, the, f the fourth. Okay. Um, the three woes, the first, the second, the third, but back to the sevens, the seven vials of God's wrath. The second is followed by the third, the third by the fourth. It's always consecutive. Those portions of Revelation which are broken into sets of seven, seals and uh, vials and trumpets, those things are consecutive. The end of Immediate or intermittent areas in books of Revelation, of the book of Revelation, such as chapter 12 and 13 and 14, are cyclical, are cyclical. They retell the same story from a different perspective. But the sevens are always consecutive. So if the seven peals of thunder are consecutive, and the seven angels are consecutive, and the seven uh, 
vials of God's wrath are consecutive, and the seven seals are consecutive, and the seven trumpets are consecutive, so the seven churches are consecutive. After the last church, Laodicea, John is told to come up hither. After these things, after Laodicea, after the last church, that is what he sees. John begins in Ephesus and makes this big circle. The church returns to the way it was in the early church. I accept this. I don't think any of these positions are wrong. I think people are only mistaken by taking one of these positions. They're all valid. Nonetheless, oh, there, there is an invalid interpretation held by certain hyper-dispensationalists going to the ridiculous point that the seven churches are seven future unbelieving Jewish synagogues <laughs> at some future point. This is utterly ridiculous, but there are extreme dispensationalists who teach it. But the main views, the historical, the panoramic, and the dispensational, I accept all of them as concurrently true, simultaneously correct. So the question becomes then, in Revelation 3.10, why does this one verse to this one church mean the entire body of Christ at a future point in history is going to be raptured before the tribulation? That's the first question. Why can you take that? What about what Jesus said to, to, to Thyatira or, or to, 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 to Smyrna or to Ephesus or to, or to Laodicea? Why are you only taking this message to this specific church and saying that applies to the whole body of Christ or at least to the faithful body of Christ at the end of the age? Well, we have to be consistent. Let us look, please, to Revelation chapter 2. What is in many respects the best church, brutally persecuted. The Lord had not one word of criticism of this church. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, now, Smyrna is the modern city of Izmir, but its root in Greek, Smyr, comes from Myr, what corpses were anointed with. The first and the last who was dead has come to life. I know your ellipsis, your tribulation, and your poverty, but you are rich in a spiritual sense. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. This was the emergence of Talmudic Judaism, or what became Talmudic Judaism, with the Council of Yavne. Uh, initially with Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, when Jewish believers were excommunicated from the synagogue, and when the Berkat Minim, the curse on believing Jews, was enunciated by the rabbis. Well, Jewish believers were persecuted by unbelieving Jews. The same happens today. Remember, we return to the early church. It goes full circle. In Israel, Orthodox Jews actually do persecute Jewish believers to the degree they can. And they're becoming more vehement about it. There's an organization called Yad Lachim that is terrible in what it says and does to Jewish believers. Kach, Kach, an organization called Kach, founded by the late American rabbi Maya Kahane, was known as the Jewish Defense League, the JDL in the United States. It was listed by governments as a terrorist organization, and they hate Jews who believe in Jesus. Synagogue of Satan. Now the synagogue here is the, means the gathering, the gathering. Well, it's not only false Jews. They're not ethnically false Jews. They're spiritually false Jews because they reject their Messiah, project, uh, persecuting the true Jews spiritually who accept the Messiah, the faithful remnant of Israel, the natural branches of the church. 
And Jesus tells this faithful church that's being persecuted, bearing in mind, not only will unbelieving Jews persecute Jewish believers, the, the apostate church will persecute the faithful church. The same thing applies. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Some dispensational church historians view this prophecy of the ten days as the ten major periods of persecution under the emperors. From Nero, Marcus Aurelius, Septimus Severitus, Decius, Diocletian, etc. Some interpret it that way. I don't say they're wrong. So, we see the same word is used in Revelation chapter 2 to the very faithful church at Smyrna. My first question to people who say that Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 proves that the church will be raptured before the seven years as they see it. How can you take what Jesus says to one church and apply it to all churches and apply it to the faithful church in the last days? Why Philadelphia? Here's my second question. How can what you say possibly be true when the church of Smyrna is told it will be there for the hour of testing? And it draws a distinction between tribulation and testing. Let's begin looking at the Greek. Revelation, I'll keep you from the hour of testing. Smyrna, you're going to go through testing. How can you say that Revelation 3.10 proves that the church won't be here for the tribulation when faithful Christians and faithful churches went through the hour of testing? Not the final hour of testing at the end of the age, but certainly they go through the testing. What is the word for testing? What is the word for tribulation? And what is the word for wrath? Is this word that we translate as testing, wrath? Is that what it is in the Greek language? No, look with me please to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 9, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for the obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Christ Jesus is him in eternity. Jesus Christ is him come to earth. We're not here for the wrath of God. The faithful church is not here for the wrath of God. This term wrath is orge. Orge. And it is indeed found in the book of Revelation. In chapter 16, the vials of his wrath. The wrath. We read that this wrath follows the removal of the church in Revelation chapter 7, the first time it appears. Save us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. From the wrath, after the sixth seal, the wrath comes. What is this talking about? Orge. That's the word orge. So, my next question to those who say Revelation 3.10 proves that the faithful church won't be here, that it will be removed before the seven years, is the following. How can that possibly be the case? It says, not orge, but peresmos, peresmos. 
The word there is not wrath. The word is paresmos. Paresmos means an induced trial. We normally translate it in English as temptation, as temptation. And it occurs many places in Scripture. Perezmos is a masculine noun. Let's look at it. In the classical literature, it is sometimes used as a medical term for medical experimentation. But its central meaning is a, a trial that has been induced. A trial that has been induced that involves calamity or affliction. And it means induced temptation. Let's look at this. Where does this word occur in Scripture? Well, the first place it occurs is in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, in the Sermon on the Mount. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, which could be understood in Greek to be the evil one. In Hebrew, Our Father who art in heaven, Paranoster quies in chalius. In the Vulgate, but in the Greek, the word is paresmos. Lead us not into paresmos. Into temptation. An induced temptation. But deliver us from the evil one. Now that's a general truth about us now and Satan. But it has a specific truth eschatologically, if you want to use the term, for the last years before the Lord comes, deliver us from the coming testing and from the evil one who will be the Antichrist. Satan literally becoming incarnated in the person of the resurrected Antichrist. Satan is cast down to you. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yes, it applies now. It's always applied but it will have a specific meaning when the Antichrist is manifested. That we would not be here for the paresmos. I will keep you from the paresmos. I will not give you into the hand of the evil one. Now let's look. Jesus said in Mark 14 that you may not come into paresmos. Matthew 26, verse 41, that you may not enter into Perezmon. This is in the Passion Narrative. Isletete is Perezmon to men. Perezmon. We continue. Mark 14, 38, that you may not come into temptation. Luke 4, 13, every Perezmon he left. Well, let's look further. Luke 8, 13. And in time of Perezmon, fall away. Luke 11, 4. Sermon on the plain, echoing the Sermon on the Mount, and lead us not into Perezmon. Luke 22, 28 who have stood by me in my pares voice, plural, in my temptations. Luke 22, 40, that you may not enter into peresmon, temptation. Acts 20, 19, and with tears and with peresmon, which came, tears and temptations. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Perezmos, that's the term, Perezmos, you are able, but with the Perezmos will provide a way of escape. 
Notice that. Galatians 4.14, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, a paresmon. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. You may not fall into temptation and a snare, a scandal on. Paresmon. Very interesting. Hebrews 3.8. As in the day of Perezmon in the wilderness, Perezmo. James 1 2, Perezmos. You encounter various Perezmos. James 1 12, who perseveres under Perezmos. 1 Peter 4 12, which comes upon you for your Perezmos. 2 Peter 2 9. Perezmo, the godly, he knows how to keep the godly from Perezmo. And Revelation 3.10, keep you from the hour of Perezmo. Over and over and over, Perezmo is a separate word from wrath. And a separate word from the lipsis, tribulation. You've got Perezmon, you've got Tribulation, and you have, which is Thelipsis, and you have uh, Orge, which is the wrath of God. It is clear, Orge, Thelipsis, and Perezmon are not synonyms. On what basis can our pre-tribulational friends give themselves a license to say that they are synonyms. Again, the scholarly people who really are embedded in the Greek scriptures say you can't say this. But people who are pre-trip without really knowing what the original languages are saying think that this means wrath. I even heard a pastor I very much like in California, great guy, I consider him to be one of my favorite pastors, personal friend, I love the guy, but he bought into this idea of 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly, he says, from wrath, that's what he taught and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Well, that's what he said. I'm speaking, of course, of, again, one of my favorite pastors and a great guy, Jack Hibbs. But that's how we read and interpreted the passage. Well, I like to read the passage rather in Greek. Okay. Odin Kurios. No, the Lord knows, okay. Eusebius, holy or pious man, ech out of peresmo. It does not say he delivers from wrath. It says he delivers from temptation. Peresmo. Secondly, I'd like to ask someone who I not only respect tremendously, but personally like very much. I'd like to ask Pastor Jack Hibbs, a great guy, good church. I'm not being critical. I'm not looking to be provocative. I'm simply asking the question. How can Second Peter, verse two, uh, chapter two, verse nine, be translated, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly from wrath? That's not what it says. It does not say orge. It says peresmo. We we hit on the rapture. It was actually, I have to say that when you go to 2 Peter chapter 2, you're specifically talking about verse 9. Mm. And a lot of us, uh, in in our effort to read through the Bible, we don't slow down enough to catch what's being said. And in verse 9, the scripture there said that the Lord knows how to reserve the wicked for the day of judgment. But the contrast to that is to deliver the godly 
uh, from wrath. And so uh, that verse, if you take the time to study it thoroughly, the key word in there is wrath. That there is a wrath that the righteous do not, in, they don't encounter that wrath. They don't experience that wrath. Mm. And so what is wrath? You have to define wrath because people wrote and said, Pastor Jack, how in the world did you come up with a rapture verse, a rapture teaching out of that verse? Yeah. Very simply, because the word wrath is the indignation of God. Yeah. The Bible, and we, we, we must, Josh, always apply what, um, what is known as expositional constancy. The word wrath in the Bible describes God's anger and vengeance and indignation against the wicked, which are called the ungodly. Mm. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere, Old and New Testament, mm -hmm. do the righteous experience the wrath of God. Yeah. Nobody, no way. In fact, the one so true is that, that Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, they go through the fiery furnace... Yeah and we believe typologically they're, they're a symbol of Israel, they went through that fiery furnace completely unscathed. Mm -hmm. Why? Because uh, they were not recipients of the wrath of God. Yeah. Uh, if you want to do typology, Daniel is not even there. Yeah. So he's pictured somewhat as the church. Yeah. Having said that, always remember that when the Bible teaches us that, for example, in the five chapters of 1 Thessalonians, each of those five chapters give you a verse or a couple of verses that teach that we will be delivered from the wrath to come. And that has nothing to do with hell. It has to do with God's vengeance on earth. Thus, 2 Peter 2.9 prompted our rapture teaching. That was the foundation of it. Yeah. So with respect, with respect, I would like to ask my pre-tribulational friends how they can say that there are passages that teach a so-called pre-tribulational rapture when their own Greek scholars who are pre-tribulational says there isn't. Temptation. We normally translate it as temptation. Lead us not into temptation. And once more, with respect, I'd like to ask my sister Jen Markell, whose ministry I very much value. I'm asking respectfully how our sister, who stood up for so much truth, how she can say that Revelation 3.10, the message to Philadelphia, is wrath or tribulation when the word is paresmo. How can it possibly be tribulation when when we look in the book of Revelation to the message to the church in Smyrna we see what she says is impossible Smyrna is told by Jesus I know your tribulation your thalipsis don't fear what you're about to suffer Satan's going to cast some of you into prison that you may be Tested, pares moon, and you will have the ellipsis. Now look at verse ten. There's pares moon, and there's the ellipsis. There is the ellipsis being uh, tribulation, and there is pares moon being a trial by temptation. How can they mean the same thing in Revelation chapter 3.10 when Revelation chapter 2.10 tells us they are two entirely different things? You can't just say it means tribulation in one place and it means wrath in another and it means temptation in another. Jesus clearly made a distinction between Paresma, as John wrote it, and Thalipsis. The time of testing of the special temptation at the 
close of the age is not tribulation or great tribulation. They're two different terms. They mean two different things. You will have tribulation, okay, that you may be tested. Why would he give Smyrna over, over to tribulation and not Philadelphia? That doesn't make sense. But let's look further. What do these words mean? How are they used? What's the difference? Wrath. We are not appointed unto wrath. Notice in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, it is at the end of the Great Tribulation that the Lord sends his angels to gather the elect. It happens at the end. Let's look at Matthew 24. Jesus says in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, this is the Megatelipson, the Great Tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 6. Exactly. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Again, exactly Revelation 6. Hide us from him who is on the throne. Hide us from the Lamb. Hide us from his wrath. Now this takes place after the sixth seal. People see him after the sixth seal. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. This is exactly what we see in Revelation 6 and 7. Right after those prophecies of Revelation 6, we see the faithful believers gathered into heaven following the anointing of the 144,000 there in heaven. That is the rapture. That is the resurrection. No, it's not between the lines, as John MacArthur says. It's literal. Revelation 7 is not the tribulation saints. It's the saints. Now, is this post-tribulationism? Yes, but not in the sense pre-tribulationists think of it. The tribulation, the great tribulation, is not the full seven years. It is the seals. His wrath comes with the seventh seal being broken. A series of catastrophes with the first trumpets, but the fifth, sixth, seventh trumpet are the three woes. That's his wrath. Then this is followed by the seven vials or bowls of wrath in chapter 16. Once the church is removed, the wrath of God or the faithful believers are removed. The church per se won't exist. Once the faithful believers are removed, God turns his purposes primarily back towards Israel and the Jews, and his wrath is unleashed upon the kingdom of Antichrist and Satan who's thrown down to earth in the power of Antichrist. <coughs> we are not here for that. We are not appointed unto wrath. Wrath does not happen until the church is removed. The tribulation is the first phase of the last seven years of Daniel's 70th week. It's followed by the wrath. We have the beginning of sorrows. We have the increasing tribulation coming to the great tribulation. Then we have the rapture and resurrection. Then we have the wrath. 
That's what the book of Revelation says. You don't see the word orge before chapter 6. You see tribulation, but not orge. Matthew 24, after the tribulation, he gathers his elect. That's what happens. We're not here for the wrath. The wrath is what happens after the rapture, but it's not before the seven years. There's no such teaching anywhere in Scripture. Who said so? <laughs> Dr. John Wolford. <laughs> it's just not there. There's no such teaching. You can have that opinion, but there's no passage that says so. Just not there. Now let's understand the difference between these terms. Tribulation comes from the devil. Wrath comes from God. Tribulation is something that God allows. Wrath is something that God does. They are two different things. The lipsis and orge, tribulation and wrath. Tribulation is something that Satan does, but God allows. Wrath is something that God does and Satan cannot disallow. Two different things. Let's continue. What is Paresmo? Paresmo is an induced testing or trial by temptation. The normal meaning, let's look at the Gospel of St. Luke. Chapter 4. Verse 1, And Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led about by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. The word is paresma. Paresma, this kind of testing, this kind of temptation, is something the devil does. But God commands. It's something that God instructs. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into temptation. One of the reasons the faithful Christians will be spared from the Perezmo is because Jesus was led into it. Now this is a complicated subject. Satan had to be defeated in the wilderness before he could be defeated on the cross and resurrection. That is when Mark shows Jesus, uh, Jesus in Mark chapter 1 shows Adam along with the animals. He's trying to show Jesus along with the animals as the second Adam, who was alone with the animals. The first Adam failed the temptations of Satan. The second Adam did not fail. Or the last Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. The first Adam failed, the last Adam did not. What does this mean? The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Those three things from John's epistle were tried on Adam and Eve, and they failed. Those same three things were tried on Jesus, and he did not fail. Jesus defeated Satan in the wilderness before he defeated him in his death and resurrection. Until Jesus reversed what the first Adam failed to do, he could not have atoned 
for what the first Adam failed to do. He had to defeat Satan first in the wilderness. That's why it says Satan left him to the appropriate time. Now notice the Holy Spirit, after his baptism, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into Parisma. The Lord's Prayer, lead us not into Parisma. Lead us not into it. Smyrna, Satan is going to persecute you and you'll have tribulation 10 days that you may be Parisma. So, the ellipsis, that is what we call tribulation, something Satan does, but God allows. Orge, wrath, is something that God does and Satan cannot disallow. Perezmon is something Satan does at the behest of God's instruction for some reason. Where do we see this in Scripture? Well, we see it in the book of Kings with Micaiah, Ahab's false prophets. The Lord said, I will put a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. The Lord sent demons into the prophets of Ahab, put lying spirits, demonic spirits in their mouths. Who will I send? The Lord sends lying spirits. God commands Satan to act. Ultimately, even Satan has to do God's will. Where do we see this in the New Testament? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 with the Antichrist, those who do not love the truth. Therefore, the Lord will send upon them a deluding influence that they may believe what is false. We see this with the son of perdition, a prophecy of Judas typifying the Antichrist in Zechariah 11, where he is called God's agent of this false shepherd. Perezmo is an act of Satan commanded by God. Quite a thing. Now there will be a special Perezmo, different than all the others, at the close of the age before Jesus comes. Yes, the church of Smyrna faced Perezmo. Paul faced Perezmo. We face Perezmon, induced trials. But there will be a special Perezmon, different than the others at the close of the age. Much the same as has always been the ellipsis, at the close of the age, there will be mega ellipsis. There's always been tribulation. Jesus said you'll have tribulation in the world at the close of the age. There will be megathelipson, great tribulation. Something that always existed becomes expanded and intensified. We call this Kal Vahomer, light to heavy, from the Midot that St. Paul would have learned and which he used so frequently in writing his epistles. Something true in a general situation becomes especially true in a heavy situation. Things that are generally true become especially important in the last days. We see this many times. Hebrews 10.25 Forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another. Fellowship is always important, but especially as you see the day approaching. There's more of it in the last days. It becomes vital to survival. If you can't stand together, you'll never stand alone. Or, we see it in uh, lead us not into temptation, <laughs> but deliver us from evil. It's always been true, but in the last days, there is the Perezmon, and the evil one is Antichrist. A general truth becomes a specifically heavy one, like the heavy Kal the Homer. There's always been false prophets, but in the last days, there's a hyper proliferation of them, like the heavy. Well, there's always been the ellipsis, but in the last days, megathelipson. 
There's always been tribulation, but now there's going to be a great tribulation, different than the others. The same is true with Parezmo. There is a special Parezmo. Elsewhere in Scripture, Parezmo was local. It affected individuals or groups of individuals, but it was local. Parezmo here, Parezmo there, Parezmo with him, Parezmo with her. But this coming Parezmo is different. Let's look once again at Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. This hour of Perezmos, which is about to come upon the entire world to test those who dwell upon the earth. It's something that's going to happen after the rapture. Where do we see this? Turn to the book of Revelation, please. Once more with the sixth seal, hide us from the presence of the Lamb and from his wrath, in verse 16. Chapter 7, After these things, behold, the great multitude, which no one could count from every nation, all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. There is nothing that teaches that's tribulation saints. That's the saints. That's the rapture. That's the resurrection. Between the sixth and seventh seal. Remember in Job? He'll see us through six, but in the seventh he will deliver us. Wow. Then we see chapter eight. The seven trumpets that come from the final seal. We see global catastrophes affecting the environment, meteorological and seismological judgments of unprecedented proportion, and then cosmic judgment, wormwood falling to the earth and so forth. Something is going to happen in a series of rapid environmental catastrophes the world won't be able to believe it'll be unprecedented. Leading up to Verse 13, And I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 or in Hebrew would be oi, 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 to those who dwell upon the earth. Notice this is something for those who dwell upon the earth after the church is removed. What is it called? Well, let's look. We see the three woes. The faithful believers are not here for those three woes. They've been removed. It's only for those who dwell upon the earth. Woe to those who dwell upon the earth. Let's continue. Turn with me, please to Revelation chapter 12. Woe to the earth! In verse 12, Revelation 12. It's the earth! Let's look further. Revelation 13. He deceives those who dwell on the earth. Revelation 13, 14, deceives those who dwell on the earth, and again, telling those who dwell on the earth. And there was given to him great breath in the image of the beast. The image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not believe to worship the image to be killed. Now, chapter 14, again, this is the non-sequential portion of Revelation. In other words, it's cyclical. It tells the same events recurrently from different perspectives. It's the seven trumpets that are consecutive, the seven seals, the seven bowls, they're all consecutive. Seven churches, they're all consecutive. 
but chapters 12, 13, 14, they're not consecutive until we get to chapter 16, the six bowls. You have a retelling of the same things from different perspectives. And what do we see? Chapter 14, those who have been purchased from the earth. Those saved by Jesus from the earth will not face this. They may be persecuted by the Antichrist up to a point, but they will not be deceived by him. Verse 14, he deceives those who dwell on the earth. The faithful believers will know how to count the number of his name, 666. They will know what it means. And they will see, as soon as the abomination, the Shikut Sameshramem is standing in a tribulational temple. And the apostate church is taken over by Antichrist. The church is the temple, seven times in the New Testament. When they see the abomination, having taken over the church and in the tribulational temple in Jerusalem, they're going to know it. They're going to know 666. Everybody else is going to be deceived. This is the hour of Paresmos, and it says it repeatedly, that comes upon the whole earth. Well, Revelation 14, 13. Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. <laughs> Uh, if you miss the rapture, it's a death sentence. If you don't take the number of the beast, it's a death sentence. The believers will be taken out of here before it gets to that point. But it will get to that point. Verse 16 he who sat on the cloud swung the sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. That's the resurrection and the rapture. But then we're told in verse 18, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vines of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. And the angel swung the sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press the wrath, the orge of God. Notice this is the first resurrection. The believers are taken out. But those on the earth? The believers will know who the Antichrist is. They won't be deceived by him. The others are going to face this hour of Paresmo, a unique hour where you either worship the Antichrist, you worship Satan, you sell your soul to him because without that mark you can't buy or sell. Whether it's a form of currency or whether it is a permit to be able to trade, we can speculate at this point, although we can clearly see the evolution of technology going in that direction, making it possible to happen at the present time. One thing is for sure, whether it's a currency or a permit, you're going to need it. This is the hour of testing. Believers will be persecuted, they'll have tribulation before Jesus comes. You'll be hated by all nations. Just look at some of the things happening now with the coronavirus. You can go get an abortion, you can go buy marijuana, but you can't go to church. This is sick. Well, it's going to get worse. There may be interim periods of respite, but it's going to get worse before it gets better in the long run. But it will get better. Jesus will return with his wrath. And we are not appointed to wrath. We will be rescued. Tribulation is tribulation. Comes from Satan. God allows it. At the end of the age, a great tribulation. A megathalipsum. Comes from Satan, but God allows it. 
then the rapture, resurrection. Then comes the wrath of God. The wrath of God. The orge. And there's actually another word for anger that is like orge on, on steroids. Nonetheless, let's look at this. God is going to bring about an hour of temptation. The Lord will send the deluding influence to make them believe what is false concerning the Antichrist, Paul says. He deceives all those who dwell on the earth. True believers do not have their hearts set on this world. They are already, by faith, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. They may be looking forward to the millennial reign of Christ on the earth, but their hearts are not in the present world. We dwell in heaven, spiritually. Those whose trust is in this life dwell on the earth. They are part of the cosmos, the world, Satan's kingdom. They will have wrath. They will face the hour of Perezmo and they will be judged with the wrath of God. Believers will have the ellipsis. There is no way with respect to my pre-tribulational brethren that if the Church of Smyrna makes a distinction between the ellipsis and Perezmo that you can make them synonyms. They're related, but they're not the same thing. Neither is there any way you can make thelipsis or gay. Tribulation is not wrath. One comes from Satan, one comes from God. One God allows, the other God does. Then there is paresma. There's paresma temptation, an induced trial. If you or I fail a test in our Christian life, say somebody struggles with, uh, with alcohol or gambling or, or sex or anything like that. If we drop our crosses and fail in that area, the Lord will allow us to be tested again until we have proved that we've overcome it. Now God already knows. He wants us to know. <laughs> he already knows. He wants us to know. You fail a test in your Christian walk or your Christian life, you keep going through it again and each time it can get a bit harder until you finally overcome by the power of God's Spirit and by the testimony and power of the Lamb. You can overcome it. God wants you to overcome it, but you're going to keep being tested. Satan will do it because God commanded him. I want you to deal with that guy's greed, his covetousness, his gambling. I want this guy to be interested in the new wine, not getting inebriated on too much alcohol, I want this guy to sleep with his wife, nobody else, or this woman to sleep with her husband, nobody else. I want to deal with this. And he lets Satan, no, he tells Satan, go ahead. God wouldn't do that. No, read the book of Job. Job was afflicted. Perezmo. But the special Perezmo at the end with the Antichrist when Satan is cast down. Oh my God, look what happens. Look what happens. You have an unleashing of demonic power in Revelation chapter 9. Look at it when these woes come. Out of the bottomless pit, men are going to seek death and not find it. People are going to want to commit suicide. It's going to be so terrible. What do we have? We have what Joel saw. We see these locusts coming out. 
The locusts was like horses prepared for battle from the book of Job. And they had hair like the hair of women and teeth like the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, etc. Like many horses rushing into battle and they have a king over them. The angel of the abyss, his name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek Apollyon, destroyer. This is only the first woe. Good God Almighty, Lord have mercy. Thank God the faithful believers are not appointed to this. This is the wrath. This is not tribulation. This is his wrath. Three walls are his wrath. The seven vials are his wrath. But the Antichrist you cannot buy or sell. This is not his wrath. This is the Perezmo. And the faithful believers like the Philadelphians will be kept from it. We're not appointed unto wrath. Lead us not into Perezmo. Deliver us from the evil one. Call the Homer, light the heavy. Those who are fleeing sin now, seeking the Lord now, will overcome to the point where the Lord will not need to test them. Those who miss the rapture, the foolish virgins, are going to be very sorry they did. We see this in the Song of Solomon in chapter 5 when Shulamit awakes and the bridegroom has come and gone and they begin to persecute her. Matthew 25 is based on the Song of Solomon. So it happens. The Song of Solomon is read in the synagogue at Passover that Saturday when Matthew 25, the Olivet Discourse, took place. The Song of Solomon to this day is in the Hebrew liturgy. Then it was in the temple, now it's in the synagogue. Hashir Hashirim is what's read. The dream when Shulamit is ready for the bridegroom to come is chapter 3. That's like the wise virgins. When she's not ready is chapter 5, the foolish ones. Look what happens to the foolish virgins. Look what happens to Shulamit when she has her worst nightmare and misses the coming of the bridegroom. I wish we'd all been ready. In this, the traditional pre-tribulationists are 100% correct. I wish we'd all been ready. Indeed, may we all be ready. Recounting. One, what people are saying like J.D. Farrick, that there are verses, passages, that prove the rapture. Well, he actually uses Gnosticism and spiritualizing texts out of context to try to prove his point. No, 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 no. John MacArthur admits it's not in there. John Wolver admits it's not in there. Even T.A. McMahon says it's not in there. J.D. Farrell says it is. There's no passage that teaches we're going to be raptured before the seven years. Say those scholars who are themselves preaching. How can you try to say there is that Revelation 3.10 proves it? That word is not orge, it's not wrath, and it's not tribulation, it's not the ellipsis, it's paresmos. And the church in Smyrna had paresmos, so you can't say that. It's not wrath or tribulation, it's paresmos. No, we're not appointed unto orge. We may be appointed unto Perezmos, but there's a coming Perezmo. That will be the Antichrist. The faithful believers will know and understand who he is. When they see the abomination of desolation set up in the church and in the temple, 
tribulational temple in Jerusalem, when they see that, and they will understand the number of the beast and what it means, they're going to be taken out of here. They'd be persecuted beforehand. Blessed are those who die in the Lord, but they're going to be taken out of here. They will not face this paresmo, where they're going to be deceived. The Antichrist is going to deceive. That's the hour of testing. The wrath of God is going to be unleashed because of it, beginning with the three woes, or beginning more accurately with the first trumpet, but culminating with the three woes, and then it gets even worse. Unbelievable. No, we're not appointed unto wrath. But Revelation 3.10 doesn't say wrath. And it doesn't say tribulation. It says perezma. For those who dwell on the earth, woe to those who dwell on the earth. I'm sorry, but those who say Revelation 3.10 means the tribulation. No. In Revelation 2.10, there are two different words in Greek and even in English. Tribulation is tribulation. Testing is testing. Or that it means wrath. No, it does not mean wrath. It means temptation, a unique temptation. The wrath is the result of it, of those who fail the test. They get the wrath, the orge. I'm not pre-trib. I don't believe the rapture can happen until the faithful church can identify the Antichrist. I take 2 Thessalonians quite literally. The idea, let those who have wisdom count the number of the beast, oh, that's the tribulation saints. If the tribulation saints had wisdom, they wouldn't be here either. They would have been raptured already. It's nonsense. Oh, that's for Israel. No, it's not for Israel. Matthew 24 is for believers. Let no one deceive you, Jesus says. He doesn't say let anyone deceive Israel. Israel is deceived already. Israel is inevitably going to be deceived by the Antichrist. He will gather his elect. The sign of your coming. It's coming for the church. This idea that Matthew 24 was, uh, is for Israel, or the Olivet Discourse was for Israel. That comes from the hyper-dispensationalism of, of Darby, uh, who said the epistle of James is not part of the New Testament, or that the Sermon on the Mount is for unbelieving Jews, it's not for Christians. Do you believe that the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, or that the Sermon on the Plain is not for Christians, or that the epistle of James is not for Christians? Do you believe that? Well, Darby did. That's how he got to say Matthew 24 is for the Jews and not for Christians. Nobody's believed that for centuries, not until the 1800s when Darby and Schofield invented it. The early Christians, those who got their doctrine directly from the apostles. I speak of patristic history. I speak of what Eusebius wrote about the earliest church. John was the last apostle returned from Patmos following the persecution of Domitian to Ephesus. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp who got his doctrine directly from John who knew John. It was Irenaeus who said John wrote Revelation, so aptly cited by Dr. Mark Hitchcock in his debate with Hank Hanegraaff. This is somebody who got his doctrine from John and knew somebody who knew John and got their doctrine from John. I speak of Irenaeus' relationship to Polycarp who got the doctrine from John. But Irenaeus wrote something else. That Papias heard John. Papias was born 60 AD CE. He would have been about 35 to 40 years old by the time John 
came back from Patmos. Would have been a 40-year-old man. And he heard John teach. Both Irenaeus and Papias, the earliest historical sources we have, said that John and the apostles taught. And by the way, Papias knew other of the apostles, according to the historical record. It just doesn't specify which ones, but he knew other apostles of the original. Papias and Irenaeus, who got their doctrine from John, say that John did not teach pre-tribulationism. He taught premillennialism, and he taught that we had to know who the Antichrist was going to be. something. Either you believe the people who got their doctrine from the apostles, or you believe John Darby. Now this is another issue. We have other teachings dealing with this. But the early church was completely premillennial. And they believed you'd have to see the Antichrist. Now let's continue looking at this in conclusion. I am not angry at anyone but Satan. I am disturbed by people who I must consider, frankly, to be ignorant, like J.D. Farrick. J.D. Farrick said, the tribulation, uh, you know, we won't be here for the tribulation. And he has seven verses to prove it, or seven, and he spiritualizes narratives as allegories, and he calls that proof. You can only use allegorical interpretation to illustrate doctrine. You can't base doctrine on it. That's Gnostic. The man is a Gnostic. Same as Bill Johnson in the NAR. Gnosticism has reinvaded the church. Bill Johnson and the New Apostolic Reformation is one example. J.D. Farring is another. He may not know he's a Gnostic, but his hermeneutics are Gnostic. He says that the apostasy is the rapture. Then he repents of it or recants it. Now he's gone back to believing it again. This is a man that seems to be unstable in what he believes. I don't know what to make of him, but I know he's very ignorant of the Word of God. He's extremely ignorant. Even by the reckoning of other pre trib people, he's an ignorant man. But then we have the people who are not ignorant. Believe me, Jack Hibbs is not an ignorant man. He's somebody who God has really used as a pastor. And I, I like that guy. I love the guy. I like his church. Jan Markell is somebody who God has used to refute error incredibly. And consistently, she's done so. She's not a foolish person. And so I ask these people. Even J.D. Farrakh, believe me, I'm not against him personally. I bear him no ill. I just know that he's off the rails. But Jack Hibbs and Jan Markell and others like them, I respect these people. I value them as brethren. I know how God has blessed them and used them, and I pray he continues to. But I ask the question, how can you find this when your own pre-tribulational academic theologians, when your own Greek scholars can't? How do you make words synonyms that aren't? How do you make words mean things that they don't mean? How do you do this? Imagine somebody, and I saw this on TV when I was a little boy in New York with Amos and Andy, the Afro-American comedians, and the kingfish, as he was called, was taking an intelligence test. And on the intelligence test, they had to put the square pegs in the square holes and the round pegs in the round holes and the diamonds. And they were doing it, and he, he couldn't get it. To, and you see him with the pen knife car carving the peg to make it fit in. That's very funny for Amos and Andy. But we shouldn't be doing that with the Word of God. We ought not. Round pegs do not fit in square holes. Revelation 2 to Smyrna, Paresmos is Paresmos, 
Ellipsis is the ellipsis. Or gay is or gay, paresmo is paresmo. You can't read a verse to mean something it doesn't say. The people who do read the Greek, who agree with you on pre-tribulationism, say it doesn't say that. How do you get this? I ask these questions sincerely and respectfully, not with hostility or contention. You're my brethren. You're my brothers and sisters. I love you in Jesus. I only want us all to have the truth, the truth we need before Jesus comes. And he is coming. Thank you so much for listening. God bless. Across the world on the World Wide Web, Genesis Christian TV.